Let's begin by posing an important question. Why should you, dear viewer, concern yourself with Viking traditions? The answer lies in a short history lesson. You see, despite the name, the Germanic tribes don't actually come from Germany. They originate in Scandinavia. That means if you have English, German or Dutch ancestry, you descend from the same tribes that the Vikings themselves descended from. Additionally, your ancestors most likely took part in the same rituals that are described in this video. We also now know a great deal about the very first Germanic tribes that emerged in Scandinavia. Their Bronze Age ancestors left behind hundreds of rock carvings, stone circles and burial mounds in the areas they inhabited. Furthermore, linguists have even reconstructed the language they spoke, which they call Proto-Germanic. Throughout this video, you'll see how English and Norwegian words descend from this language. For example, let's see how the Norwegian word Jul and the English word Jul descend from a common ancestor. Pretty cool, huh? We can also see how important Yule was to the Germanic tribes by examining their winter calendars. The Anglo-Saxons called December Ara Yaula, or before Yule, and January was called After Yaula, or After Yule. In Old Icelandic, the period between mid-November and mid-December was called Ylir, which translates to Yule. I also wanted to mention that I've enlisted the help of a leading academic. My name is Herdeik Bakli, and I'm a cultural historian. And I'm working at the Southeast uh, University of Norway. For now, though, let's rewind to the year 793 AD, the beginning of the Viking era. Golden Dog, or Velkommen til Norge. In European pre industrial societies, it's estimated that at least 80% of the population worked in agriculture. The average farmer and his family worked between eight to nine hours a day in a never-ending routine dictated by the seasons, wary of the lingering threats of war, disease and starvation. According to studies, famines could occur every 20 years and crop failures could occur every 10 years. Unsurprisingly, superstitious farmers turned to magic, charms and rituals in the hope of a bountiful harvest in the coming year. Furthermore, food was so scarce during winter that even the livestock had to be slaughtered. Over time, the rituals and the slaughter of livestock began to take a ceremonial nature. The winter solstice, falling on either the 21st or 22nd of December, marked a turning point in the fortunes of farmers, with the lengthening of the days marked with a feast in cultures all around the world. The Romans celebrated Saturnalia, the Anglo-Saxons celebrated Mother's Night, and in the state of Punjab, India, where I originally come from, we still celebrate Lodi on January the 13th. It's remarkably similar to other midwinter festivals. The village comes alive with a communal feast, drinking and traditional dancing. Adults and or children go door to door singing folk songs in return for treats. Offerings are made to a deity in the hope of a good harvest the next year, and a communal bonfire is lit to keep evil forces at bay or as a symbol of the lengthening days. In Scandinavia, the midwinter festival was called Jol. It wasn't celebrated on December the 25th, though. The Vikings celebrated the Christmas at Håkunott. This Håkunott uh, was the mid winter. According to the old um, calendar, the 14th October was the first day of winter and uh, the 14th of April was the first day of uh, summer. So between this, the midwinter had to be the 13th, the 14th January. Yol was celebrated over three nights at a long house on a large farm. The chief had invited his friends and their partners, and much like today, the seating plan was arranged according to social status. The chief took every opportunity to exhibit their wealth and status. In an interview with NRK, Anne Doxra writes that the chiefs wore colorful jewelry and that pink was considered a masculine color in the Viking Age. They may have also ordered wine from Southern Europe. What could we expect during the celebration itself? As food was scarce during winter, it's believed guests would bring their own food and drink. They could expect poetry, storytelling, and perhaps even music. As full-time priests didn't exist, the chief led the rituals, four of which we have strong evidence of. The blot or blood sacrifice was a regular event in the Germanic pagan calendar. For the Anglo-Saxons, November was actually called Blotmonath, or blood sacrifice month. It was thought that sacrificing animals would honor the gods and ensure a good harvest in the following year. The Vikings sacrificed pigs and horses in a theatrical fashion. An analysis of ox bones in Iceland indicated that they were killed by blows to the neck, with the intention of creating showers of blood from the arteries. The blood, which is thought to exhibit special properties, was carefully collected in bowls. Twigs were then dipped into the bowl and flicked onto the walls, statues of the gods and the guests themselves. The meat was then boiled in a hanging pot before being served to the guests. 
However, it wasn't just animals that were sacrificed, according to an account by Adam of Bremen, a medieval chronicler from Germany. In 1070 AD, in Uppsala, Sweden, he tells of a ritual held every nine years, when nine males of every living creature, including humans, were sacrificed and hung in a sacred grove. Additionally, in the sagas, there are accounts of prisoners of war and slaves being sacrificed to honor Odin. And in the account of Swedish king Domalde, the king himself was sacrificed because of widespread famine due to successive years of crop failure. The Sonargolter was a boar sacrificed at Jol connection with Freud. After the sacrifice, guests would put their hands on its bristles and make solemn vows, a ritual called heitsringing. Harold Fairhair is said to have taken part in this ritual himself, promising to not comb or cut his hair until he ruled all of Norway. Over time, this brutal ritual evolved and today lives on in two forms. A sweet marzipan pig sold throughout Scandinavia during Christmas and on Swedish dinner tables as Yule Shinka, or Christmas ham. In pop culture, Vikings are often associated with alcohol. This isn't by accident. In a poem, uh, the author was Thorbjörn Horn Klove. He made a poem around 900. And in this poem, he says, Uti vil jo drekka. So it means that uh, the Vikings drank beer to celebrate Christmas, the pre-Christian uh, Christmas. So this was a very important part of uh, the celebration. In the Viking age, brewing beer was mandatory for large farms. If it wasn't brewed, fines were imposed on the farmer. And if they weren't paid, the farm could be seized and the farmer deported. At some point during the celebration, the chief led a ritual where he honored the gods and the ancestors with a series of toasts. And then they uh, drank beer to honor Odin, Njord, Frey, Thor, and, and they drank till Ors och Fridar. So to got uh, a good harvest, to got fertility and, uh, and to got peace in the coming year. Later, the Viking king Håkon the Good, who was raised in England as a Christian, changed the law so that the toast was made in honor of Christ and Saint Mary, to good year and peace. The Icelander Snorri wrote Heimskringla, and in the saga to Håkon the Good, he tells that uh, Håkon made a law that the Norwegian had to celebrate uh, Christmas at the same time uh, as the Christians. Which is when the date of Yule was changed to December the 25th, in line with the rest of Europe. Today, Norwegians say skull when making a toast, which literally means bowl, referring to the Viking drinking bowls of old. In Germany, the word prost is used, which derives from prosit, which is Latin for be well. Confusingly, prosit also made it into Norwegian, where it is the standard response if you sneeze. The last ritual is the Jule book, or Christmas goat. The link between a goat figure and winter appears in other European cultures, such as Krampus in Germany and in Finland, where to this day, Santa Claus is actually called Jaulabuki, or the Christmas goat. In Norway, villagers wore terrifying homemade costumes that resembled a goat. The Yule book went door to door, warning children to behave themselves and also demanding gifts in return for protection against evil spirits. After Christianity, children began taking part in the tradition, singing Christmas carols in return for treats. In the 19th century, the Yule book evolved from being the recipient of gifts to a benevolent deliverer of gifts, in a role similar to Santa Claus. It's a very complicated figure. But if you come to the 19th century, they believed that uh, the Yule book uh, had brought uh, with them uh, happiness. Then they went from farm to farm and uh, they, they had to got something to eat or drink. If they did not get anything, it was said that they took the, the Christmas with them. And maybe the last farm they visited, they had to, they danced uh, to the late night. I, I think this um, custom uh, is not so popular today because of the Halloween. So it is very seldom to see a Yule book today. But when I grew up, uh, I have practiced Yule book myself. Unfortunately, all that remains of the once fearsome Yule book is a straw Christmas decoration, apart from this one in Sweden, which has a story of its own.
Velkommen til gamle byen Fredrikstad, ca. 1567. The perfect location to talk about how Norway celebrated Jul after Christianity became firmly established. The pre-Christmas period was considered holy, and several measures were introduced to maintain Julefrid, or Christmas peace. Julevakter, or Christmas guards, would patrol the streets, and if you were found to break the law, you would receive double the usual punishment. I have some um, sources about it from Bergen and from Stavanger, and they uh, went through the streets and um, they look after the people. However, any punishment had to wait until after Christmas because trials came to a halt. Additionally, Norwegians couldn't get married in the three weeks preceding Christmas and during the 12 days of Christmas. Back at home, people embraced living simply by eating basic food or fasting. So when Christmas came around, it was a richer, more fulfilling experience. So it was an archbishop in um, Nidaros, Jon Raude. He made a new law, the first day of Christmas, the eighth uh, day of Christmas and the thirteenth day of Christmas. It uh, should be a very holy day. And this day should be celebrated by the priests and the people. So we had to start the celebration about three o'clock the day before the first uh, day of Christmas. Uh, they also had to uh, only drink water, one fast. You had to be 14 years before you, uh, you participate in one fast. And then you, you should not um, work on these days. And uh, this uh, is the quite opposite today, where we have Julebord, uh, where people are gathering, social gatherings, and uh, eat a lot of good food. So this is in contrast between the tradition from the 19th century. In modern times, the first corporate Julebord was advertised in Aftenposten in 1961. And in Setestal in Norway, they, uh, they had what they called Skogdrischelag, the 21st of, um, of December. And then they gathered people at the farm and also some neighbors. And then there was tasting the new beer. And it was very important that the beer was strong. It was should be so strong that when the third person tasted the beer, the first person was going to sing. At some point before Christmas Eve, the household organized a Julevask, or Christmas wash. The roof was brushed and the ceilings, walls and floors were scrubbed clean. Afterwards, furniture and metal objects were polished and simple textile decorations were put up. This cleaning tradition continues to this day, with 44% of Norwegians partaking in a deep clean of the house just before Christmas. On Christmas Eve, the household would bathe in order of importance the husband, the wife, the children, and then the servants. Like other European cultures at the time, this might have been the only time that the whole body was thoroughly washed during the year. What makes this particularly interesting is the Norwegian word for Saturday, lerdag, derives from laugodagr, which means washing day in Old Norse. That means it's entirely possible that Viking era Norwegians were cleaner than those living in the Middle Ages. Then came the first of two Christmas dinners. The first happened between five and six o'clock, and the second between 11 and 12 o'clock. The food that was served depended on the century, which we'll discuss later in the video. The last uh, meal that there was the, what we could say, the rettlige høytid, small tide, the real holy day meal, I mean, if it's translated, yes. Christmas Eve was thought to be like Halloween, a time when the barrier between the worlds of the living and the dead became porous. This was a double-edged sword, as it meant that both deceased ancestors and evil spirits could cross over. The ancestors could look forward to a truly VIP experience at their former homes. Extra servings of Christmas dinner were left for them on the dining table, and if there was food missing in the morning, it was regarded as evidence of a visit. People would also leave their beds empty for their ancestors to rest in. Uh, instead of laying in the beds, they lay down on the floor together. Sometimes they lay down naked. I, I was told that uh, it was practiced that they lay down on the floor as late as in the beginning of the 20th century. Belief in evil forces was very real. People stayed indoors on Christmas Eve and didn't dare to venture out until sunrise. To ward evil spirits off before sunset, people would carve or paint crosses on doors, 
sheds, broomsticks, beer barrels, and even animals. There are accounts of crosses being carved into butter, as it could also be enchanted. In Telemark, up until the 1860s, people wouldn't even go to sleep. They stayed up all night holding a candlelight Christmas vigil. What were they afraid of? One example was the Wild Hunt, a Germanic pagan belief that has been attested in Scandinavia, Germany, and Britain. In the Scandinavian version, the Wild Hunt is led by Odin, Thor, or another deity, followed by an entourage of Valkyries, Berserkers, and the souls of dead hunters on black horses. They were looking to gather souls of the dead, so to see it was considered a bad omen. If Norwegians went outside, they genuinely believed they could be abducted or have their souls stolen. You could uh, get some information about the future also, uh during Christmas and uh, when the when uh, the supernatural beings are around you can get contact with them and the people were interested in how the harvest would be where it will be best to fish and the young people are very interested in who they're going to uh, marry and the old people are interested in who are going to die the coming year. There was a different way of going uh, to get information about who you are going to marry. And uh, then you could go outside and go three times backwards around the house and then you also pray our father also backwards and a third time you come to the door you will meet the person you're going to marry but uh, if you uh, are not going to marry you will um, you will meet your coffin so it was very risky i think but uh, there was also another way of uh, getting information of your coming partner uh, you uh, could um, take your clothes, which you are going to uh, use the day after the first day of Christmas, to church, and you lay the clothes at a chair, and then you uh, set three bubbles in front of them, one bubble with beer, one with milk, and one with water and then you had to sit down in the name of the devil and uh, 12 o'clock christmas eve your partner was going to come and if he uh, drank from the bowl with beer it should be it should be very rich if the person drank from the bowl with milk it should be okay but if the um, person drank from the bowl with water, they should be very poor. It is told that there was um, a girl that sat down and uh, did this, and first there come one man in, and afterwards there come another man in, and she got married with both of them. He also wrote in an interview with Foschkling.no about a few other traditions. The first is that someone could sneak out during dinner on Christmas Eve, walk around the house three times and take a look inside a window. If someone appeared headless, they would die within the air. If everyone made it to sunrise on Christmas Day, people were only allowed outside to visit church. If they got bored and wanted some action, they were out of luck, because you couldn't have sex on Christmas Day. Another tradition is that the weather on the 12 days of Christmas predicted the weather for the upcoming year. For example, the first day of Christmas represented the weather in January, the second day of Christmas represented February, and so on. Elsewhere in Scandinavia, there were other creatures associated with Christmas. In North Norway, young men dressed up as Ulandish, donning a costume made up of wild animal skins, fangs, horns, and even fake blood. Norwegians were supposed to keep on top of Christmas preparations, especially the baking, so they had something to give him when he came knocking on their door. If they didn't, he might kidnap their children. Further afield, in Iceland, they had the Yule Lads, a group of 13 mischievous pranksters who left gifts or rotten potatoes for children, depending on whether they were good or bad. 